Hi, I'm Darren McAvoy, Extension Assistant Professor of Forestry at Utah State University. Thank you for listening to my presentation today on in-woods biochar production using big box biochar kilns. It's part of the Salvage Summit. An outline of today's presentation includes an introduction to myself and the Utah Biomass Resources Group and some of our backgrounds relevant to the presentation. Talk to you about big box kiln designs and operation and some of the lessons and some of the details you might be interested in to hopefully have your own big box operation. I represent the Utah Biomass Resources Group. I'm chair and co-founder of the group. Uh, these are some of our partners. Partners are super important to me. I really don't do anything without partners. The Southern Rockies Fire Science Network and the Utah Department of Natural Resources, the USDA Forest Service, and the Bureau of Land Management are all key to all the work that you're going to be seeing today. So the Biomass Group, UBRG or Utah Biomass Resources Group, started off not just by burning stuff in boxes like I'm going to show you uh, today. We started off actually with a gasifier in 2010 and in about 2012 stepped up to a pyrolysis, a mobile pyrolysis machine that we were able to scale up with a Sun Grant for half a million dollars. And this is the scaled up version of the mobile pyrolysis machine that you see on your photo. And it's operating in the Utah desert, Utah desert, uh, or actually Nevada desert for a 40 day run here. And it's quite successful, made high quality biochar and high quality bio oil. But at the time, the price of oil was quite high. And when the price of oil dropped around 2014, uh, we started to focus more on biochar. And this machine is still quite valuable and, and quite effective. It's run now by Go Biochar out of Salt Lake City. And I partner with it regularly and in Go Biochar. But I was looking for a, a simpler means for biochar production in the woods that was somewhat more accessible. And that's what I'm going to share with you today. One of the lessons of working with high-end biochar, biomass processing machines, like you saw in the previous photo, is that in some cases it was costing us more to chip the material to, to process the feedstock than it was to pyrolyze the feedstock. And that didn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, that's what pushed me towards looking for simpler methods that could uh, step aside, step, step away from all the the material handling costs. Um, the accessibility of the big machine is, is somewhat more challenging. They're expensive to operate, ex expensive to purchase and to move around. And the bio oil handling was somewhat of an issue, especially when the, the value of the bio oil dropped concurrent with the value of the, the, the fossil fuels. These experiences led me to uh, pointed me towards a need for a simple, low cost in woods biochar production method. In 2017, I was able to get a USU extension grant to bring four of these Oregon kilns and Kelpie Wilson came and trained us uh, on using these kilns. She came from Oregon to do this. These are five foot by five foot kilns and they're a very effective teaching tool and learning tool. Um, they're very accessible and, and inexpensive, but um, they're very small scale. I was looking for something a little bit bigger. And so I was able to get this 2019 Utah Public Lands Initiative grant to create this big box biochar approach that I'm sharing with you today. Our first kiln is shown here, the BB-16. This is a demonstration we did just outside of Logan on US Forest Service land in Providence Canyon. The BB-16 is 16 foot long and eight foot wide and about six foot tall. It weighs about 3000 pounds and is a single wall construction kiln. As you can see here, we're using a, a very large, I think this is a 34,000 pound excavator to move and operate this kiln. And our second set of kilns uh, are the BB-12s. They're 12 foot long, uh, six foot, wide and four foot high. They're double wall construction. Uh, that double wall helps protect the operators and the machinery from the heat that's going on inside of the kiln. and also creates more even heat distribution and biochar production within the kiln. 
I learned some of these lessons through cooperation with my partners, Kelpie Wilson and Ken Carloni out of Oregon. The BLM owns its own BB-12. This is the second one that we have built. And these are some of the fuels that we will be working on. Uh, at, I want to share with you today. Most of the photos are from post salvage operations that we've done here in Utah, but a few of them are from the Moab area where we were uh, pyrolyzing Russian olive. The process starts by loading the kiln with a, a rick of logs, a crisscross pattern of, of logs down in, the, down in the kiln to make it somewhat airy. Need oxygen to get the fire started. And then eventually the oxygen will be limited because uh, there's no holes around the outside of the kiln. This kiln is completely loaded. It's always kind of a mess we just throw in there. And then we top light it. My colleague, Will Munger, top lighting a uh, BB-16. Kind of see the single wall construction there. And then what happens is a flame cap forms over the top of the kiln and it consumes all those combustibles as they rise up through the collar. So it makes for a, a cleaner burn. And a little bit like tending a campfire, we keep adding fuels as, as they burn down. You don't want to add too much at once and smother your fire, but you don't want all your coals to burn up either. So it's a, it's a bit of an art. What we learned, and I was very surprised, I lost a lot of sleep over this going into this project, but uh, excavators are surprisingly durable uh, around the heat. I thought we'd be replacing hoses and buying new equipment for people, but with careful, careful operation and operators, uh, we find that you can get in there and tend the kiln and pull it away. And the operators are very good at maintaining and, and monitoring the, the amount of heat that, that's on the machine. And we so far haven't had any problems with that. Here again, looking across that flame cap of an operating kiln. Um, what we're looking for before we in the process or quench the kiln is when the flaming combustion that you see here drops down to glowing combustion. That's gonna happen in the next few minutes on this kiln. And we might quench uh, when that happens or when the kiln is full. This is a mostly full kiln here that you see, or it might happen at end of shift or often it happens mid shift. So we get two batches in, in the course of a day, right around lunch, we'll quench, dump and start again after lunch. Quenching takes about 300 gallons, you need an engine on site. As you can see in this photo, it's better to get all the water in the kiln than, than spray it out on the other side. Um, and here our landowner uh, is actually using the pump and operating the pump with the help of the operator uh, from the Provo River. So it uh, gets rid of a piece of equipment, you don't need an engine or a water tender on site, but you do need water on site one way, one way or the other. I found that quenching inside of the kiln is safer, less exposure uh, to the firefighters for steam and smoke and heat. A little more efficient to quench inside of the kiln. And a, a word about fire safety, of course. Uh, best to construct a fire line around the outside of your operation, the kiln and your dumping space before uh, you start. Embers are generally known not to come out of these kilns from wind and such, generally speaking. But I have seen examples where when we drop a fresh log on there, uh, an ember pops out. We had a smoking cow pie at a, at a kiln operation here in June. That could have been problematic. So it has to be watched out for. Um, should always have a charged hose available anytime you, you before you light a kiln. And uh, always confirm that the heat, the fire is completely extinguished before you walk away from a site with cold trailing. I was a firefighter for uh, about 15 years. I used to be on the Flathead Hotshot crew. Done lots of cold trailing, um, just bare hands, running your bare hands through the entire portion of biochar slowly at first so you don't burn yourself, use the back of your hand. But uh, um, just want to make sure everything is cool, don't want any fires. Continuing, 
tipping the kiln is one of the trickier parts. I think one of the more hazard, hazardous parts of the whole operation, still refining that. Here we're using chains attached to the kiln to tip it over. Um, you don't want to be the guy that has to put that log underneath like I was that, that propped it up to get a better hold of, uh, get a better hold of the kiln being underneath a 3000 pound box of, of heat is not a lot of fun, um, but um, they're not that hard to tip with a experienced operator. Um, and you can tip it just by grabbing the sides of the kiln as well. Here we're quenching as we tip at the same time. I want to point out that uh, the kilns can be dragged uh, around the site uh, while they're operating. So you finish up one landing and want to move it to the next. Don't want to quench, and sort of stop the process in the middle. You can just drag that kiln to the next site if it's, if it's close by. And it's worth pointing out that one kiln or one machine can operate a couple of different kilns simultaneously for better efficiency. And consider here we're operating two different kilns, but consider the distance between the kilns. I generally have found that it's best to just stack up the kilns on one landing and, and consume all of that landing material before you move your kiln on to the next site. Is it in here, the operator's got to run back and forth between these two kilns, and this is about the maximum distance you want to have them running back and forth. Some of the lessons of our first BB-16 build are that at six foot high, it's quite difficult for the operator to, to see into and to, to light, as you can see here. Um, and uh, the single wall construction of the BB-16 actually puts a lot of heat on the firefighters and, and on the equipment. Uh, we find that it's much cheaper and easier to use a small excavator than a 34,000 pound track hoe. Uh, often the firefighters or landowners will, can rent or operate these machines themselves. Uh, this eliminates the need for a low boy and a, and a trained operator and scheduling uh, of a big expensive machine. Of course, if you're doing this concurrent with your logging, you want to use whatever logging machinery you have available, which tends to be a lot bigger. But coming in later, it's a lot more efficient just to use a mini excavator. Here's a mini X unloading the BB16.2, as I'm calling it. Uh, that's a modified BB-16, was originally six foot high and now we reduced it down to four foot to make it easier to work around and, and throw material into and see down inside of. Um, that reduced the weight once we chopped it down a little bit to 2,300 pounds, makes it easier for a mini excavator to move around. Also, it makes it more transportable to the small pick with a regular pickup. Here it's on a fifth wheel trailer, we're pulling it off. We're saying that uh, double wall construction of a BB-12 makes it much easier to heat your burritos at lunchtime. I want to point out the dog doors on these kilns, as we call them. They're a draining port, uh, so to speak. And here, this one is partially opened. We find that the double wall construction of the BB-12s makes for a more sturdy frame for the dog doors. This is the dog door on the BB-16 after many different burns in several different locations. It's a little bit mangled, but still operational. Probably needs reinforced before we run into a, um, another burn. But also wanted to point out the skids on the bottom of the kiln or dragging around landing sites. I think a lot about putting roll-off technology under these kilns to make them easier to load and unload onto trailers. But I can see that it's gonna be a challenge for moving them around the sites, around sites. So kind of still working out some of those details. I wanna point out the eyelets up high and down low for dragging the kiln around the site and for tipping it, for general uh, holding it down when we're, when we're transporting it. Those eyelets on the front were originally down on the ground. It's pretty hard to uh, get clevises and, and stuff through there. So we had them moved up a couple inches. Also want to point out the fork pockets there in the center of the kiln on the bottom. So it can be lifted and moved around with uh, the big forklift. 
We have snuffing lids, as they're called, for these kilns. Um, here, firefighters removing snuffing lids after they've been on all night. I was hoping that uh, they would actually snuff the fire. I'm still experimenting with them. In this case, when we removed the lids in the morning, the, the fire just resumed. So it was useful for delaying the operation, but it didn't uh, put the fire out as I was kind of hoping it might. Um, Stuffing lids can be useful for delaying the process, but also important for fire safety. If you suddenly had an unexpected windstorm pickup or you had a fire call on the other side of the forest or something, you want to sort of halt the operation or at least make it safe to walk away from and just put these lids uh, on and walk away. As you sort of witnessed here from these photographs, the kilns can process large or small diameter materials. Do find that uh, large diameter materials are less efficient for char production. Um, medium sized logs are best for, for the maximum amount of biochar, but these large logs do consume inside the kiln. If you can envision it's sort of a sliding scale between what's more important for the landowner or for the manager, is it a hazardous fuel production or reduction, or is it biochar production. If it's biochar production, you might want to quench sooner, more often. If it's just hazardous fuel reduction, then you can just kind of keep loading the kilns. You don't have to worry as much about quenching as frequently. In this particular instance, uh, this char was going to be used for a nursery on site, is going to be used for nursery, a tree nursery on site. So biochar production was important on, on that particular sale. I want to point out the cooperation with your local foresters is super important and managers this is PJ Abraham from the Heaper City District of the Utah Division of Forestry, Fire and State Lands. I, as I said earlier, I don't do anything without partners and the success of this operation is very much dependent on partners like PJ. And working with the operators and getting the firefighters and the operators to sort of communicate and figure out what they need and their limitations. Uh, sort of coaching them through that is an important part of the process. Then air quality monitoring, I wanted to mention something about that. This is a device set up by the Utah Department of Environmental Quality right next to my operating big box kiln. And they found that uh, this device picked up no more smoke or particulate matter than a similar device that was that is planted 10 miles north of here. So pretty good success as far as keeping the air clean with these kilns and the flame cap approach. Um, but we are unfortunately still subject to pile burning limitations and restrictions here in Utah. We're working with folks to try to get around that, but right now we, we still have those, limited, those limitations. And that's an area of investigation for me. I wanna do some research on and, and have some numbers and, and data on, on the air quality impact from big box biochar kilns. And when you're burning green material, freshly cut material like this, this is from this is at a ranch here in Logan of their smaller kilns, actually our smallest kilns. And they had a wind throw. We had a wind throw event here about a year ago. And so we we're burning very green material, which can work on a dry, dry day like this. Uh, green material on a raining day may not work so well, depending how dry it actually is. Um, but it does produce a lot more smoke, that green material, than if you're doing dry material. My Oregon colleagues will tend to throw, as they're hot logging, as they're logging, they'll just throw everything green or not, four inches and less in diameter directly into the kilns as they go, kind of thinking that anything over four inch diameter doesn't really add to spreading a fire quickly. So that's, that's one approach. And biochar is an important tool for forest restoration. Here, we're applying the biochar back in the forest. Uh, of course, if these logs were just burned or left to rot, all that carbon would go back into the air. And that biochar on the forest floor there is 85% pure carbon with a half-life of almost a thousand years. So this is the only way I'm aware of that we can teach people to store carbon long-term durable carbon sequestration on the ranch, on the farm, or right, even right at home. And all that carbon in the soil will 
improve the microbial ecosystem of that soil. Here we're spreading cooled char from previous day's uh, operation out on the landing using a mini excavator for landing recovery. And here the landowner and operator is breaking down the char. It's quite brittle and friable. And so he's using the mini excavator to break it down into smaller pieces for agricultural application. Really best to leave it in big pieces for just spreading it out on the forest. And here you can see some sticks that are completely or not completely charred. And if we, we have larger diameter, those can be pretty big chunks of logs, we call them bones. And the choice is you can either throw them into the next kiln for more complete combustion uh, of those materials, or they can be set aside and used for hugu culture, which is a growing method where we bury logs and grow uh, vegetables and things from that material and biocharred logs tend to make great base for hugu culture, or just spread out in the forest for crop coarse woody debris that, that's very durable. I want to give mention to this other approach that we're starting to experiment with working with my colleagues Debbie Dumrose and, and Kelly Wilson and others and a sort of kilnless biochar production. This is in cooperation with the Payette National Forest and New Meadows District went up there last summer. We tore apart several piles that they had made in traditional methods or just throw everything in a pile. Here we're starting with a deck or a corduroy of the biggest logs on the ground to help protect the ground from the heat and we'll pile everything else on top of it. And we think this will better protect the soil from that heat. Important part of that operation is to top light it, as you see here, where we top let this pile and that will create uh, less heat on the ground, we think, and, and provide more biochar production. So we're saying that the kilns are certainly more expensive than traditional pile burning. Uh, here we're doing both at the same time, so they can be done concurrently, which maybe saves a few dollars. Kiln approach is much more labor and equipment intensive, um, but it, as I mentioned, it does preserve the carbon. We think it puts less heat on the soil, less smoke in the air. Those are both uh, approaches that need further research and investigation. Um, and we think it might be a better way of doing, doing business in some instances. I want to remind people that historically there were a lot of there was a lot of biochar or charcoal production across the Intermountain West. These are historic beehive kilns just over the line in, in Wyoming, just out of Utah, that we looked at at a forestry conference a few years ago. And uh, I think they might offer a clue to what we might have coming in our future here. I was fortunate to present this big box biochar information at an international forestry conference, a UFU a UFRO conference in Brazil two years ago and learned about these kilns that they use there. They look very similar to our old beehive kilns from the previous photo. And my colleague from Northern Arizona University, Hansu Pan, and I did a little back of the napkin rough calculation that shows that in Brazil, they used this simple method of, of carbonization and they reduced hazardous fuels or consumed more biomass than exists in all of California and all of Arizona as hazardous fuels today. So this stands as somewhat of a note of optimism that these simple approaches can be fairly effective in getting a handle on our hazardous fuels problem. This is my contact information. I'd be more than happy to visit with you or possibly come to your forest or area to help you conduct a big box biochar operation. Thank you for your attention.